The Minister for Environment, Conservation and Climate Change, John Pondari, says the Climate Change Fund from developed countries does not go close to assisting the smaller vulnerable nations like Papua New Guinea. We talked to Mr. Pundari on a number of climate change issues earlier today. Thank you, Minister, for talking to us. Sir, you are the Minister for Environment and Conservation, also climate change. Environment and conservation are two important portfolios, I suppose. Uh, we've talked about them, you've expressed. Uh, as Minister, you've talked about them. But climate change is overwhelming that world, if you like. And I think Papua New Guinea is taken in into that. And you've talked about it. Sir, from a government st uh, standpoint, what are we at now with climate change in the country? Well, climate change, as we all know, uh, during the reign of our Grand Chief, uh, Sir Michael uh, Samari, he established uh, the Office of Climate Change and Development. Uh, that was a significant move by the government then, uh, giving uh, recognition to the fact that climate change was real, it was affecting the world, and uh, Papua New Guinea was not immune no. uh, to climate change. Uh, following on from there, we have now developed the uh, uh, climate change uh, uh, compatible policy. We have uh, now developed a legislation and uh, it is now an act of parliament. We call it the uh, Climate Change uh, Management Bill. Okay, okay. All right, we need mm -hmm. to talk about compatible policy, compatible growth. Just yes. explain that a little bit. Well, it is an overarching uh, policy that uh, any agency of the state or institutions or corporations can dovetail into it and be able to develop uh, climate smart policies. Okay. For example, in agriculture, you need food security. Climate change is here. It's just going to affect our livelihoods. So what sort of uh, uh, agriculture smart policy do we need as a country going forward for our survival? Uh, the need to adapt to climate change is here. Now, what sort of uh, policies do we need uh, insofar as, uh, for example, uh, infrastructural development in the country? Right. Uh, you've got floods, you know, that heat our bridges and, yes. and overturn them. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, the flooding that, uh, that causes roadblocks, etc. Now, this is going to affect our economy going forward, going into the future. So what sort of infrastructure do we uh, want to build going into the future? So it's all about doing the right thing as a country, yes. given the uh, challenges of climate change. And, and just on that, yeah. also... Yeah. Health is another issue with, exactly. I think the malaria question is a big one. Well, vector borne diseases like malaria, uh, it's another effect of climate change. Uh, it's going to affect our people everywhere. And uh, places where you haven't seen mosquitoes, you now begin to, to well, realize islands, mosquitoes. In the islands, for instance. Yeah. And uh, it's all here. It's, 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 it's real. We, we just have to be a climate smart country. Okay, okay. Let's take one at a time now. Agriculture, we are an agricultural country. Our yeah. people are dependent on it. Um, climate change, uh, okay, it can bring drought, it can bring rains. Exactly right. uh, is it good or bad for agriculture? I mean, um, if it rains, it's a good thing, is it not? Uh, what do we need to do here, particularly with our mm. crops? Mm -hmm. Well, how do you prepare yourself? How do you uh, ensure that... Uh, you will be able to adapt to the different challenges of, 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 of climate change. For example, uh, we just have had an experience uh, up in the islands region, you know, about uh, one to two million people yeah. of our population were affected as a result of, uh, of frost. And uh, it's, it's never been easy for our people. Now, what sort of food security uh, policy will be able to help support sustaining and maintaining the livelihood of our people going forward. These are some of the things that, that uh, maybe the Department of Agriculture will have, will have to do some studies on and be able to come up with a policy framework that the next time when we are it, we are prepared for it. Mm -hmm. uh, climate change, uh, John, as you and I know, is affecting economic uh, trends uh, all over the world, and, uh, and Papua New Guinea is no exception. No. Our national economy 
uh, will be affected. Uh, for example, if you look at Octedi for that matter, you, you had a long dry spell, uh, the water level of the Fly River system uh, dried up, yeah. you weren't able to bring up your uh, supplies for the operation, you had to close down. Uh, what happened with the frost and the drought as a result of the uh, El Nino effect? Uh, what we uh, as a government did was we just didn't have in a budgetary allocation. No. Well, and well, we had we, to look elsewhere. That's right. We've got an ADB <laughs> report, I think, that says that uh, in the, when, as we head to the, towards the next century, our economy will have declined by 15% because of that. Well, there are smart, uh, intelligent people out there that are researching into what could be our challenges uh, in the future. And uh, some of these studies uh, have to be taken seriously as a government and we need to prepare for the challenges ahead. Yeah. Now, we just cannot as a country uh, be too reliant on our traditional uh, uh, economy where you derive your revenue from to support your, uh, your, your budgetary uh, expenditures. Yeah. Uh, I think we need to be innovative. We need to think smarter. We need to look at uh, uh, different uh, ways and means of, of, of encouraging investment, of growing the economy. We just cannot be too reliant on our traditional, maybe the extractive industry or the export of agricultural commodities for that matter. Uh, we just have to uh, see how best we can be able to diversify and uh, be able to encourage investment. And I know that the challenges will be there for us to, uh, to, to looking at incentives and ways where you can be able to encourage uh, new capital investment into the economy. Uh, multinationals will be interested, but how do we attract them? There are industries that Papua New Guinea may never be able to invest itself uh, given its own citizen and as a government. Industries that we might not be able to create ourselves in the next 20 to maybe 50 years. So why do we have to sit back, relax and wait until the time comes? We might as well create that incentive open the doors and get these investors to come in. That's the path of climate change compatible? Well, there can be uh, investments uh, considered in areas of uh, climate change uh, uh, technologies, green technologies. Uh, the global community is now um, looking at uh, climate change as an opportunity for economic benefits and growth as well. It's not seen just as a challenge on, on, on the global community, uh, for vulnerable countries like Papua New Guinea and others in the Pacific to, to adapt to and, that, uh, and, 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 and a cry for needed funds alone, you know. But I think it, it, it opens for, for opportunities that I believe Papua New Guinea can be able to create incentives. Now, look at we, we just been to the Paris uh, conference. That's right. Okay, that's, uh, that's an area uh, I want to talk, uh, talk exactly about. Exactly right. Let's get into that. Uh, we, we just have to go to a break here, so we'll get into that. That's an important one. This is PNG tonight. Uh, our guest is the Minister for Environment and Conservation and Climate Change, the Honourable John Punari. Back after this.